All right. So earlier today, Adam Neely, who is a, a friend of mine and, and a great YouTuber and, and probably some of you, maybe all of you, uh, have seen some of his videos or maybe subscribed to his channel, but he dropped a video today, a rather long one and a very good one, uh, encompassing the um, controversy, uh, the recent controversy over uh, music theorist Dr. Philip Ewell's um, uh, plenary address, which then got some uh, I'm not going to go over all the details, but anyway, long story short, uh, uh, Dr. Ewell uh, had a plenary address for the Society of Music Theory uh, last year, actually, and uh, his address ruffled some feathers because his address basically said what was true, that uh, music theory, as we know it, as we study it, as it, as it gets taught in institutions across the country, is largely framed within a fairly narrow uh, uh, focus of Western uh, classical music. Uh, but that really wasn't his main point. His main point was is that this framing is not just because of the music, but because of the um, idea of white supremacy uh, and, and often that this vaulting of, of <clears throat> the Western classical tradition is often done so at the expense of other music in the tradition, in the Western tradition, say jazz, and also, of course, non-Western or, or cultures with just as rich, if not richer and longer musical traditions than that of Western music. The reason why I am res uh, responding to this and, and talk, want to talk about this is because uh, in the last couple of weeks, I have been thinking rather strongly of submitting a proposal for a sabbatical to uh, write a music theory book, uh, but not the same kind of music theory book that we would all, uh, if those of you who have studied music theory would would have would see uh, the kind of the stack of typical music theory books. Uh, when I grew up and I went through music school, and this was back in the early '90s, early mid '90s, and then. A little bit later for the PhD, but I, I wasn't I didn't do much music theory there. Uh, you know, of course, we learned in in the tr traditional conservatory uh, model, but I found that to be pretty narrow. Narrow for a number of reasons. First of all, as a composer, it's narrow because the music that I was composing and that my friends were composing didn't quite fit the pieces. The pieces didn't fit the mold, if you will. So there was the first disconnect. Uh, the other disconnect was my love of jazz and and having started out as a jazz player, I always felt like, well, why is jazz sort of put over to the side and maybe talked about a little bit or ignored or brushed under the table or just sometimes, you know, it just doesn't exist in sort of traditional music theory textbooks, but also even in music theory curricula. Now, at New England Conservatory of Music, however, I didn't have that experience uh, because I actually got to study uh, uh, some some jazz theory with some of the great, great, uh, greats. Uh, well, my dad, of course, was one of them, but also uh, George Russell. And I took George Russell's graduate, I was an undergraduate, but I took his graduate uh, Lydian Chromatic Concept, the intro uh, to Lydian Chromatic Concept. and. Um, and I've got some great George stories. I love George. Uh, and, um, and I often think that George gets ignored, uh, generally speaking, and should receive more love and more attention uh, that he, he, he rightfully deserves because he was really on to something. I, if I could just teach comp composition and orchestration and all that kind of stuff, I would do that. But I started teaching music theory as soon as I landed a job in academia, and I've never not taught a music theory class because basically most jobs, so those of you who are out there looking for jobs, most jobs have you do a lot of things. It's not just you just teach composition. If you're a composer, you're going to teach music theory. You're going to probably teach some music history. You're probably going to do something else. You probably will also wash the dishes and park the cars. So that's at most schools. It's kind of do everything, and by the way, uh, you're not getting a pay cut. Uh, you're not getting a pay raise this year. 
uh, but that's another story. And there is my first slide. Uh, most all music theory textbooks suck. Okay, so that's my first, that's my opening salvo. Now, I have a lot of really amazing, wonderful music theory friends, and uh, they might disagree with me on some of this, but that's okay. Uh, we're all we're all friends. We're still friends, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is it is my contention that most theory textbooks do a bad job, and I've reviewed many of them. As somebody who has taught music theory for now, this is my thirteenth uh, year of teaching music theory as a full time person in higher ed. Um, I can honestly say that with the exception of my first year, I never adopted a music theory textbook. I have looked at them. I get sent them by publishers all the time. And if there are publishers watching, I probably won't get any more. Uh, but that's fine. You can still send them to me. I still uh, look at them. By the way, the subtitles aren't available because the speaking voice is too quiet. Well, thank you very much, uh, PowerPoint. I haven't found a music theory textbook uh, that really addresses theory in the way that I think it should be addressed, okay? Now, of course, you know, maybe the way that I think it should be addressed, and as we go through uh, the, uh, as I go through this presentation, uh, maybe you'll agree or disagree with me, and that's fine. Actually, I'm really curious, uh, especially if you've teaching music theory, but um, I just think that most music theory textbooks, they, they just miss the mark on so many things. But moving along, is a notion of tonal music theory and counterpoint. So, you know, I've got my bullet points here. If you can see them, uh, you know, I, I'm going to try not to do the, the, the bad teacher of like basically reading my own slide. But uh, in, in summary, uh, um, first of all, all music theory, no matter what the culture is, is culturally specific, right? So, so Western music theory uh, is derived from Western music, Europe, largely European music, uh, and therefore it's focused on that, which it should be. I mean, that's not a bad thing, okay? So, uh, and I'll say later that the study of Western music theory is not a bad thing, but there are other reasons why we should perhaps do a little bit different of a job when it comes to teaching. Um, so anyway, it, it does a great job of, of, of covering uh, a, a large portion of really great stuff like Mozart and Beethoven and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it does focus, the time period is focused within uh, what is sometimes referred to as the quote unquote common practice period, um, which basically means the classical, uh, well, very late Baroque classical for, for sure. And then early to mid romantic period is basically your your common practice, which basically is 1700 to 1875. Those dates are not firm. It's not like 1876 happened and suddenly it was there was no tonal music. Uh, but basically, that's the notion. Now, um, when I went to New England Conservatory of Music, and, and Adam Neely actually pointed this out uh, in the opening salvo of his video, you know, he said, replace music theory with 18th century European musical practice. I forget what he said. And it's funny, I was like, ding, ding, ding. At New England Conservatory of Music, when I took theory, as we would know it, the class wasn't called music theory. It was called 18th and 19th century harmonic practice. Now that is accurate because when I learned four-part writing and counterpoint, I learned it basically within the common practice period of the 18th and 19th century. And, and, and that's how the class should be labeled. In a curriculum, I feel it would make sense to have a class, maybe a semester, maybe two semesters, of 18th and 19th century harmonic practice. But then, of course, other things can happen, right? Uh, this foundation of music theory that's often taught will then get awkwardly and kind of jury-rigged applied to other music. Uh, first of all, it does a very poor job of talking about music that happened, say, prior to about 1680 or so, okay? Uh, again, plus minus, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not here to pass a, a, a PhD entrance examination, but 
Um, it does a poor job. Like if you look at, at Gesualdo, the music of Gesualdo. Now, those of you out there who don't know who I'm talking about, Carlo Gesualdo, uh, uh, a uh, Italian composer um, of basically the late 16th century into the early 17th century, wrote some crazy music, wonderful stuff, kind of a controversial character. Um, I hope there's not a, a hashtag cancel Gesualdo because of what he did. Uh, you can look that up. I'm not going to talk about Gesualdo. Gesualdo did some bad stuff, but nonetheless, his music is 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 amazing. Uh, and well, you know, any any of the composers from that period, basically up in Monteverdi, for example, uh, the the sort of the uh, if you will father, as sometimes referred to, of opera. Um, so. Uh, it does a bad job there. It does a bad job even inside its own, its own cultural, uh, its own cultural house. Sixteenth-century modal counterpoint is not eighteenth and nineteenth-century harmonic practice. Okay, so there's there's there are disconnects even within the theory itself. I mean, within the notion of music theory, that's that's kind of used as an umbrella term. And of course, anything that happens in the late Romantic and twentieth century. Uh, to today, well, it, it, it breaks down. Now, it's not like there aren't things that couldn't be applied, and there are, but it's still, it's, 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 a, it's a forced issue, okay? Um, so there's that. Now, moving on is to post-tonal music theory. Well, of, co of course, that is something meant to be addressed uh, or something to address music of the 20th century. Well, um, it is also very myopic. Um, when I learned set theory, I, I, by the way, I'm a theory nerd, so I, I like all this stuff. I enjoy it. I, I can totally nerd and geek out about music theory with, with the best of them. But uh, it's very focused. Uh, so post-tonal theory that we learn, and, and, I, and I've taught it, and I've all, all, every time I get to the unit, I like teaching it. I enjoy it. But I also feel like it's, 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 it talks about a specific kind of music at a specific period in Europe, and it kind of ignores other stuff. So, I mean, and I, like I said, I love it, but but again, if you're if it's the second Viennese school, it works out great. Um, second Viennese school being Schoenberg, Berg, Webern, etc. So, uh, set theory and twelve tone, uh, which basically twelve tone is taught by music theorists in music theory classes, but it actually was just kind of a compositional tool that was made up by Schoenberg and I guess if you argue, I think Hauer, but, uh, uh, but it's not a theory. It's, it's a compositional tool. And so it's kind of interesting how these things get fudged around a bit. Um, and, it, and then, but it doesn't talk like, for example, Charles Ives. Okay. Now Charles Ives was writing music at the same time that Schoenberg was writing music and Charles Ives, it's like, you have to think about other ways of talking about Charles Ives if you're going to talk about it within the frameworks of music theory. So, you, so, so music theorists uh, will often cherry pick all these various things to try to put together some kind of way of understanding Ives's music, or Carl Ruggles' music, or um, you know whatever the case may be from the same time period. So, so there's that. Then there's jazz music theory. Um, and Kyle, you'll appreciate this if you're still on the horn, if you're still with us. Uh, it's siloed. And, and here's the thing. I love jazz, and I'm a jazz, I guess, a jazz player. Uh, you know, I, I don't play the instrument anymore, but, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's always this separate thing in music departments or music schools. It, it's, all, it's rarely, and I'm not saying for all things, by the way, because I... By the by, by no means do I have a. Uh, I, I'm not working with uh, empirical data, but just the, the what I know from my experience and from others' experience and from when I visit programs and so forth, is that it is siloed, and that jazz theory classes that are taught to undergrads in the jazz program are often taught, you know, at the same time that these kids are getting, say, music theory in traditional ways. And they don't cross. They don't communicate. They don't. Then it seems like they don't want to communicate. And I don't blame this on the jazzers. I blame this more on the traditional music theorists. Um, and and a good example I mentioned. I I have this up on my 
on my slide is the augmented sixth chord. Um, and when I went to the University of Tennessee, uh, I taught for one year at the University of Tennessee. I, I, I love my colleagues there, by the way, if there's anybody watching from UT, um, Keith, um, Allison, um, Jackie, uh, hello, miss you guys. Um, I taught theory. I wasn't in the composition department. I just, I, I was just, you know, I was there to teach theory um, for one year as a replacement, a visiting replacement. Now, <laughs> um, so when I taught theory, I would always find out who, you know, what, what, dis, uh, what uh, majors the, uh, the students were, and I'd have the jazz majors, some jazz majors, and I'd have classical majors. So I would teach the augmented sixth chord to the classical students, kind of along the lines that, that the textbook would teach, you know, the raised fourth and flat six and all that kind of business. Uh, and then I'd look at the jazz players, and all I'd have to say is, okay, man, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a flat five, uh, dominant seven chord uh, on the supertonic. And uh, and if you if you it's a rootless voicing with a with a with a flat nine uh, on top uh, if you're going to do the German, and there was like immediately they're like oh yeah totally we totally get that that's totally cool uh, the jazz theory is a little bit more organic because it is integral to performance practice that oftentimes jazz theory is taught as a means of performance practice and composition practice rather than that of analysis. That isn't to say that you couldn't use jazz theory for analysis, and it often is, but, uh, but I think the performative practice aspect of that is significant and important. Uh, and this comes to my issue of practice. Now, I think it's time to revisit the pedagogy, not, not only because of the racist overtones, and no pun intended on the overtones, uh, but, um, but because of the, uh, uh, just I think because of the musicianship aspect and the performance aspect, there's a lot of things. I think music theory has gone stale, largely. And, and, and I know that there are probably some of my theory friends out there who will be screaming at the, at, at, at the screen at me. I'm sorry, I'm a composer. So I'm, I'm basically like the bull in the china shop right now. I, musical practice really shouldn't be separated from the theory that it should be integral, it should be connected um, in, in, in at least some, some important ways. With music theory, and I use music theory, when I use the term music theory, I'm talking about Western music theory, is there's, there's almost no attention paid to acoustics or psychoacoustics. And the very first thing I do when I teach theory in my basic musicianship class, so like right now when I'm teaching in the first couple weeks of my basic music musicianship class, is I teach them acoustics. Now, of course, I don't get nerdy with all the math and and stuff like this. I, I do talk about string length, tension, and, and density, and things like things of this nature that control the fundamental uh, or, uh, or um, standing waves in a tube and that sort of thing. But I, I don't get heavy with the math. But I think all musicians, and all musicians who, pra who play an instrument inherently learn at some point the physics of their instrument. If you're, if you're a string player, guitar player, whatever, you learn the physics of strings just by doing what you're doing, and uh, it, comes, it comes through. But uh, how that connects to like theory uh, and, and the practice of the music, uh, I, I, I think we can't talk about like a C middle C and not talk about, well, what is middle C? I mean, what is sound? What is, what are we, what, what are the resources that we're dealing with? Sound and silence punctuated in time, right? Time is never talked about. And I don't have this on the slide, but just sort of in thinking about this, we don't really talk about musical time. We talk about rhythm, like, you know, clap your hand on two and four, but in terms of like the, the, the perception of time and how time and space are controlled, in a musical situation, um, so uh, so a, a point that I use here is is the point of things like figured bass or, or figured notation for inversions. So when we talk about inversions, we talk about first inversion six chord, second inversion six four chord. Okay, great, that's fine, but we're not talking about the acoustics of that. And 
you know, when I get to talking about, say, the, the second inversion triad in tonal music, so in 18th and 19th century harmonic practice, I can't talk about that chord and say, well, you know, don't use it unless you're at the cadence or as a passing chord. And their students are like, well, why? Well, because it's inherently unstable. Well, why? Well, because the bass note and the overtones of the, that bass note are in conflict with the notes up above. Well, the, the inherent conflict that the bass note has with the tones that are ringing, they're not in resonance, right? That's why we have that sound. The sixth chord is not in resonance with itself. It's not in tune with itself because of the overtone series. Um, and, uh, and so here's the other issue, is timbre. Uh, you know, a first inversion triad, uh, let's say, um, you can all hear that. I got my piano keyboard out here. So, you know, that chord uh, will sound entirely different played by three clarinets in pianissimo as opposed to a piano, right, at a different dynamic. Um, and in fact, you know, music theory boils that down to, well, those are just the three notes. Well, they are. I mean, you know, we can talk about that from a functional point of view, but, but are we addressing it from a musical point of view? Right? And this is why orchestration and, 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 and acoustics are, I think, integral to learning music theory, um, even if you're not a composer. If you're a composer, it's absolutely essential, um, even if you do electronic music. So, you know, I, I was explaining to my electronic music students today uh, that it's really important to understand things like acoustics and, and all this stuff because, yeah, you can, you can fiddle with dials in a synth uh, you know, in Ableton or in Reason or in FL Studio, whatever it might be, but you're not knowing what you're doing until you're knowing what you're doing. And when you know what you're doing in terms of acoustics, then you really can actually start to do sound design. And it will separate you from the 95% of other people in their bedrooms working on the same stuff. So if you want to be a real producer, like, like a separating yourself from the rest, you got to learn this stuff. Related to that, uh, harmony, we, we, we tend to abstract harmony for, for, for good reasons, not bad reasons, in Western uh, tonal music uh, or post-tonal music for that matter. In post-tonal music, we reduce things to often to sets. In tonal music, to chords that we can label. But we don't talk about uh, the, the fact that harmony is really uh, a kind of a texture. We, it's, it's a texture, it's a, it's a combination of vibrations that we receive, and that texture, of course, is also influenced by timbre. So, um, so there, there, there has to be a different way of talking about harmony that, that also goes beyond the notion of, well, that's a C major triad, or that's a German augmented sixth chord, or whatever it might be. I, I feel there are probably some more interesting ways of talking about harmony that work truly on a vertical plane than just sort of talking about it like it's just some kind of structure that sort of exists and it's just there and whatever. I don't know how many of you know the Lydian chromatic uh, concept, uh, but, uh, but like I said at the beginning, uh, I had studied with George a little bit. I just took a, um, you know, I took his class and, uh, and, uh, and George was really lovely to me. He respected and adored my father. Um, and uh, so he was always super sweet to me. You know, his formulation of, of the Lydian mode is being kind of the, 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 the mode that was at most peace with itself in terms of vertical, what he would call gravity, it has to do with its, its, its uh, relationship of the perfect fifth, its, its construction of basically a series of perfect fifths, and that, that engendered it with the uh, the spirit of restfulness and kind of, if you will, the parent mode. And I, I think of the Lydian mode as the top of the circle of fifths. So in my circle of fifths, F is at the top. So it's not a new thing, by the way. Uh, I should point out that the, the idea of constructing scales and fifths, using the perfect fifth more or less as, a, as your basis, and even the idea of equal temperament goes back a long way. Uh, they're Chinese music theorists several thousand years ago that had worked out a lot of this stuff, for example, and other cultures have also experimented with things like tuning and, and, and scales and all this kind of business of, of working out how to partition essentially pitch space. 
Um, and that's why I said tuning is another matter. One of my opening lines is I point to the piano and I said, hey, that piano was just tuned last week for the beginning of the semester, but that thing is not in tune. And then they all look at me like I have spiders crawling out of my head. And then I go on for the rest of the semester kind of telling them why. So uh, moving on, uh, back to number one. <laughs> Most music theory textbooks suck. Yes, I, I am going to just say that. And that's, that's my incendiary bomb for, for the evening. Um, and most music programs are too myopic. They are too focused in, in, in a singular approach and uh, also focused on this uh, idea that somehow Western classical music is the only thing and it's therefore the best thing. And really the, the, the controversy that was stirred up by uh, Philip Yule really came about uh, in the sense that he, he sort of called out Schenker uh, for uh, his incredibly narrow view of classical music. So, you know, in Schenker's eyes, uh, he, um, he really only viewed about a dozen composers as being worthy of attention and everything else you know, he ignored. Uh, now, uh, I, I didn't put a slide in for this. Uh, I was going to say, like, like the idea of studying Shankar is, is uh, you know, that's, that's not to dissuade anybody from, from learning Shankarian analysis as an as a analysis technique, um, but it by no means is, 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 a univ is a technique that you can apply across the board. It, can, it works very well for the limited period, even more limited period of time than say 18th and 19th century harmonic practice, the idea of like doing a textual reduction, which Shankarian analysis, one of the processes of a Shankarian analysis is, is to do a textual reduction, can be useful and can be in insightful. But the actual tools there really aren't uh, uh, useful beyond a very narrow slice of music. So as I said, Western music theory has a lot of awesome stuff, and it does. And we live and work in a culture that's largely based in Western culture, but blending a lot of other cultures in America, African cultures and, and, and all the immigrant cultures that come in. So, uh, we, you know, it makes sense to have a kind of focus, a primary focus on Western music as a result, but I think not at the expense of everything else. So, you know, in studying music, and music theory, uh, it makes sense to learn a number of approaches and then use these approaches in a blended way uh, to better understand the music and also not to separate it, like I said earlier, from practice. Because ultimately, we're practicing music on one level or another as performers, as creators, improvisers, composers, whatever that might be. So there's that. Is I want to develop an open text like a fully featured open source text online online text with videos and 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 exercises and all this kind of stuff whatever whatever it might be i haven't quite obviously formulated all the details and and make it free it's will be completely free um and um and and part of that is part of that is uh, for my for myself as a teacher, I'm developing this as essentially a way of putting all this stuff that I've been learning, and my whole experience, my life experience to date down on paper, if you will, virtual paper, but also uh, to make it available to my students, so that they don't have to shell out $150 for a stupid textbook and make all the musical examples available and with the recordings, so they don't have to shell out another. $50 for a stupid anthology. Now, I, I love printed scores and stuff like this. This is not to say that I don't want people to go out and buy scores because I love smelling paper. Uh, if you've never smelled a score, you're missing out on something. Uh, that's weird, but it's true. Uh, so, um, but I don't want my students to have to spend all that money uh, when it's out there. The music is out there. My knowledge is out there, etc. And the other thing is, is that is that it makes it available to people who, uh, who might not have the time or the resources to afford to come to a school like Roger Williams or to go to a conservatory or college. So, I mean, differently advantaged people. Uh, 
um, both in the United States and across the world. Again, uh, uh, as somebody who teaches music theory, uh, I, I, I felt compelled to, to, to address at least the issue at hand. Of the, the, I think the thing that people miss, the people who, who uh, react, I think, uh, first and, don't th and think later to Yule is that they think that Yule is saying, oh, we should not teach theory anymore. We shouldn't teach Schenker anymore. We shouldn't teach figured bass anymore or any of this. He's not saying any of that. He's just saying, hey, I think we need to stop being so, uh, so singular about it. Because when we, when we, and I, again, I mean the royal we, not everybody who might be watching does this, but uh, I think when, when, when theory is taught, at the college level especially, but even at the high school level for that matter, it's often taught as the only thing. We, we talk about music theory as if there's just one music theory and we don't mention, by the way, this is talking about Western music and in some cases, very specific time period in Western music. Um, so uh, that's, that's my thrust for tonight. Thanks, everybody. Now I really will say goodbye and sign off. Appreciate it. Take care.